Hi everyone, Josh Fletcher here uh, from DSL, and I'm joined by Irfan Khan from SAP. Hi, Irfan. Hi, Josh. Nice to see you again. You, good to see you too. Thanks for joining us. Um, for those that aren't familiar with uh, who you are, what's your role at SAP, and, and also where do you come from in the world? So I'll start from where I came from in the world. I came from Sybase, uh, one of the acquisitions that SAP made mm -hmm. in 2010. Uh, I was at Sybase, would have been 20 years this uh, coming March, March 29th. Wow, great. Uh, and over that period of time, I held a variety of roles, but the, least, the, the, sorry, the last role that I had at SAP was the Chief Technology Officer globally for SAP, sorry, for Sybase. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that gave me uh, quite a lot of background in customer, of course, requirements, and, and most, most importantly, in the technology architectural side that customers were driving. Within SAP, I have two roles. One is that I head up... Uh, solution management globally for all things database, data warehousing, mm -hmm. and I also have this uh, other role that I have, which is the head of strategy, DNT, chief technology officer for DNT within SAP as well. Yep. Excellent. So we're um, here in Melbourne together at the Mastering SAP Technologies Conference. Um, you keynoted this morning. What were some of the kind of key messages that you conveyed in the keynote? So the keynote actually was a great opportunity to, to get everybody in Sydney, Melbourne, and of course the whole of the Australian region up to speed on, on really where SAP is as a technology company. I think technology at SAP has really taken on its extra vitality, certainly since uh, the announcement of SAP HANA, which mm -hmm. of course is a major mind shift that's going on, going on in the industry, more importantly within SAP as well. But my keynote really addressed uh, two or three things. It was really what's driving the thinking process within SAP from the technology investments that we're making and how customers are going to be able to consume that, those investments in the short, medium, long term. Yeah. Okay. And one of the, um, the things you focused on was the real-time data platform, and that's, that's a, an inter area of interest for me. Um, can you give us a little bit of uh, detail about um, the real-time data platform for the general um, SAP user or customer? Sure. So SAP real-time data platform is a confluence of, of a number of technologies that SAP has within its portfolio. Mm -hmm. As I've mentioned, Sybase was acquired by SAP in 2010. So around about April 10th, I think it was, we made the announcement of the real-time data platform. And this is really for two purposes. Number one, real-time doesn't exist without HANA. HANA is a constituent part of the real-time enablement, if you like. And then around that, we have the need to support a wide variety of other data use cases and, of course, data customer requirements. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're able to leverage the extent of the Sybase portfolio. So whether it's IQ for being able to manage big data at an economical price point based upon disk, mm -hmm. uh, also at the same time, whether it's uh, ASC for extreme transaction processing, or another key example of an asset that we have, which is SQL Anywhere, which is really there for allowing edge-based processing, so where you have a variety of applications that are either developed for uh, low administration overhead, so whether they're deployed to the field user uh, directly perhaps on a laptop, or even something which may be embedded in a, in a vending machine, okay, right? You still need to have a stateful repository, and SQL Anywhere is one of those databases that's used within that. So real-time data platform is really bringing together a whole host of use cases and a broad spectrum of data in order for it to be all processed within a real-time component of SAP HANA, but also extending that capability to using all these other extended use cases from the broader technology offering from SAP. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the roadmap around the real-time data platform talks about three stages and, and technically how you're going to start to introduce features into each of these technical components. Um, what does the uh, end goal look like in terms of time frame? Is this going to be happening over the next few years? So the, you're right to point out that there were phases that we described. So there's an integration, an optimization, then an ultimate synthesis phase. The goal really is that we're not driving... I mean, firstly, RTDP or real-time data platform isn't a product. Okay? You don't buy an RTDP product. But what you do buy is you buy into the vision of an evolving platform that will be delivered to customers in a non-disruptive way, allowing customers to adopt functionality as and when it's warranted within their application environment. Mm -hmm. But the guarantee is that from an SAP point of view that we're bringing about change given the broad portfolio of offering that we have in this way that will allow large number of incremental but high value releases to be introduced in the point product set which ultimately over time evolved to this real-time data platform. So just to be very clear about this, each and every product that we have today of course, is a full-fledged product that has a very captive market. Mm -hmm. ASE example, 30,000 customers. IQ, 5,000 plus customers. You take a look at 5,000 instances. You take a look at uh, SQL Anywhere, more than 10 million units of SQL Anywhere being deployed. And then HANA, of course, over 1,000 customers, more than 200 running live. Now, that's really the, it's almost like a wide uh, expanse of SAP and, and, of course, Sybase customers out there. Mm -hmm. And they all want to be able to benefit from the innovations of in-memory. 
And starting off with a real real-time data platform and HANA at the center and at the core, we're actually able to provide bi-directional value to customers who may be cyber customers who want to leverage HANA, HANA customers that may want to leverage a broader set of use cases that may be possible using the cyber portfolio. Mm -hmm. So the real value today right now is it's kind of leaving no customer standing. It's going to be delivered in a number of high value and incremental releases. And there are certain foundational technologies that we're building out in the platform, which I can give you some commentary about. Yeah, well, could you expand on those? Sure. So, since I brought the question <laughs> up, the, the notion really of the, the foundational work is that there's three key characteristics that you need to have within a data platform, we believe at least anyway. Number one, we need to have the, the ability to perform federated query access. So that means that if you're a, an existing Sybase customer, as an example, you've invested in ASC, you have a whole host of complex uh, mission-critical applications built in ASC. If you wanted to leverage, say, HANA and have the extension of in-memory compute as a, perhaps as an acceleration on top of what you already do, having native query federation built into all of our technologies, all of our database stores, right, implies that you can access data from ASC and access the data that may be residing in HANA natively as if you're connected to it. So this is really leveraging one of the key characteristics of Sybase in terms of its openness, which is something called the Component Integration Services layer. And that really provides a proxy-based federated support to accessing data heterogeneously across a variety of different data stores. Mm -hmm. So that's foundation pro property number one, federated query access. Number two is if you look at the different mechanisms of actually interoperating with data, sometimes federated access is actually good enough, and it makes a lot of sense. But in some instances, you may want to have low-latency low distribution of data and synchronization of data, hence the investment in real-time low-latency replication. So that's another foundational property. All of our stores, all of our database assets, ASC, IQ, SQL, Anywhere, and of course HANA, should be able to interoperate with a very low-latency communication mm -hmm. uh, backbone, so to speak, an information highway that, that allows all of these stores to interoperate. So that's the second foundational property. The third one is as we extend the functionality of HANA to be able to deal with much larger data sets, it may be economically more viable to store all of the active data in memory, which is a lot of customers are doing, mm -hmm. but then also supplementing that with, say, perhaps data that you store in a traditional store, like, say, for instance, a disk-based store. And that may be for very cold data yeah. from a multi-temperature standpoint. If we choose to do that, IQ has a, an, an inherent opportunity to be able to provide, say, HANA with the unification of data, potentially going across in memory and across on a disk based uh, access paradigm. Mm. So, what we're driving towards as a foundation is a unified table view, which provides endpoints in terms of customers to be able to have a single point of extraction, HANA, and be able to deal with that multiple temperatures of access that they may need to reside you know, across in memory and, of course, on disk as well. Okay. Um, some of the other uh, parts of the roadmap talk about a common uh, and unified modeling tool and uh, data quality tool and monitoring tool. Can you give us a little bit of detail about that? Sure. So the old adage of garbage in, garbage out makes a lot of sense and makes, of course, the need for us as SAP to drive not only just purely the, the data services, mm -hmm. but also the smart uh, information management and governance services that would have to support that. So we think about it from the whole life cycle of management of data, from the quality, the cleansing, of course, the master data governance. All of these true aspects of data management have to be brought into concert with one another. So the platform that we have, the real-time data platform, is actually supported by a whole host of smart data services, and those services are there then to provide the additional value add for making sure that we keep the, the landscape in the terms of the real-time platform serviced, but with the most you know, most coherent and, and, uh, and uh, quality-driven set of data that you'd want to pursue, you know, put, uh, have in the platform. Yeah. That, um, so there's quite a lot of potential there for new application development in terms of, you know, are, we, are you thinking about how that will relate to an application developer who needs to choose a database to build his new application on? Can he use HANA as a front-end to access these other systems and will he be able to leverage a lot of that power through the new application development? Sure. So, great question. So, I mean, HANA is essentially the real-time data enablement piece. Mm -hmm. It allows us, because by the virtue of the architecture of HANA, it allows you to be able to do, of course, OLTP and OLAP processing within a pure in-memory footprint. Now, if a customer truly wants to have all of their active data all served up and managed within a single consolidated store, HANA will be the absolute starting point. Mm -hmm. But that's to say now, let's assume a customer has got a major investment already in Sybase and they may be running perhaps mission-critical OLTP type of applications in, say, ASC.
by virtue of us making those foundational investments from a developer standpoint and by building out pure enterprise architectural features. So, for example, modeling, mm -hmm. being able to model an application across the two different constituent stores, but serving up the data artifacts. The, the, if you want to call it the semantic layer across these two different environments, mm. but making it abstract. So from a developer point of view, using either the federated access or whether it's proxy access or whatever it might be, you don't give the heartburn to the developer. You know, there's three fundamental questions that all developers have to answer. Where is my data? How am I going to get to my data? And once, effectively, once I have them, what am I going to do with my data? Now, this in itself, what we want to try to mitigate customers or developers from is the risk and the, the overhead of figuring out how do I get to my data. Because that seems to preoccupy the majority of developers. Is it in the right format? Is it in the right sort of, am I getting at the right latency for, you know, value, et cetera? So the idea is that we want to have tooling and development tooling around that that makes it very easy for developers to construct next generation applications, be it custom or extensions to business suite. And that's really the crux of what we're trying to drive here for developers. Okay. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, a lot of our um, listeners and viewers are BI or data warehousing consultants. So uh, for these type, of, or these type of professionals, what should they be focusing on to um, be ready for the real-time data platform in terms of a, a learning perspective? Good question. So if you once again take a look at the, uh, the skill set, our real-time data platform is focusing on existing developers and existing skill sets that are out there. Mm. So it's an interesting question because it's not really loaded to answer the, answer mm. the question in the following way, but I've got to make this distinction. If you happen to be an analytics BI type of a person, you're probably familiar with a lot of the visualization technologies and techniques that are being used out there. Mm. But what's really driving the value of the platform is being able to do much more in database type processing. So where you automatically you would think about large scale materialization of data out of the platform into some BI tooling and then do whether it's going to be you know, introspection of that data in some, some you know, abstract tool you can actually push down that kind of logic and, and the kind of workload directly to the database tier. Mm. And this is really the, the, the kind of the bridge that will exist between the BI world and the analytics world. Yep. If you wanted to purely do analytical type of operations in a kind of almost an abstract tool, the answer is that you can still do that. We've got fantastic capabilities and business objects to be able to do that. Standalone. But if you really want to take the benefit of the platform, sorry, the, uh, the the, the consolidation of the platform and the real-time nature of the platform. We truly believe that more in-database type processing is really the way to go here. Mm. And I think we're seeing that from the business objects product suite with the likes of Visual Intelligence and Explorer looking to push all the processing down to HANA in this case um, and serve that up in just result sets. Sure. Yeah. And let's be realistic here. I mean, in some instances that makes a lot of sense. And mm. if you wanted to replace, for example, uh, an in-memory cache or with, say, HANA, to be able to achieve that, that makes perfect sense. But in some scenarios, customers are actually wanting to keep a separate or separation layer between just doing visualization and having a store which could be used there to do some very native type of database processing. In those, in those instances, you know, we have a very credible offer with business objects. It's evolving, as you say, with visual mm -hmm. intelligence. And, of course, extending to that, we also have, through the, the whole innovation of being able to consolidate a lot of the reporting front ends that we have, mm -hmm. making the UX experience that much easier and the developer experience that much easier, business objects has a, a role to play almost as a standalone entity in its own right as well. So would it be worth um, uh, data warehouse professionals starting to look at um, the other tool sets in the, the real-time data platform that are going to form that, that as well? Absolutely. I mean, we have some work to do to, to make sure that we evangelize the true breadth of the platform. You know, it's almost uh, ironic. Each time, you, each time I sit down, at least anyway, and we start going through the bill of materials in terms of what we have now as a collective set of assets within the company, it's actually mind-boggling mm. because we have so much value to be able to, dis you know, to be able to deliver to the market. The intent really is that as customers start skilling up or tooling up or retraining in some instances, what we'll be able to do is because of the openness of the platform is that they should be able to bring their skills to the platform, not have to completely learn net new skills. In some instances, we are innovating new development languages, new kind of me mentalities in terms of how applications should be developed. But more often than not, it's to reuse the skills that you have. This is a key pivotal part of our platform. It's the non-disruptive innovation path that we're on, not to disrupt either skill set or individuals in terms of their look, you know, the domains that they have of, of knowledge. Excellent. Well, uh, on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today and also for coming down to Australia and, and doing the keynote for us. It was much appreciated. My so pleasure. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thanks, Josh. Cheers.
Coast and it's sponsored by Lily Technologies. Visit us on the net at SaveTheCMS.com. Hey, Trust Admiral. D-Slayer!